thank you for that uh, introduct uh, introduction. Um, I'm sitting here going through uh, some of the topics that we had, um, you know, leading up today. And uh, uh, there's some of the information I'm about to share that, you know, quite frankly, uh, Peter has done an excellent job. Before I get started, you know, I do want to thank my colleagues from the working group. Uh, as we talked about this session and talked about how we're going to convey kind of our message uh, or try to articulate the points that we're trying to get across, uh, I'm honored that they asked me to speak on their behalf. Um, I think this is an area where from the working group that uh, ARC has helped us pull together, it is an area where we have found more and more common pinch points that we need your help, we need industry, and we need suppliers to come together so that we can further you know, accelerate up uh, towards our vision. So um, I've been impressed you know, all week. I'm sure all of you as well, if you've attended a number of sessions and whether it's the you know, AR, VR, whether it's talking about the metaverse, there's a lot of work that's been going on in this space, right? And what I wanna do is I wanna spend a little bit of time of maybe stretch a little bit of the vision of where we are today versus potentially where does that look like in the future, okay? Um, and so you've heard from an ExxonMobil standpoint, we are shifting to a more visual way of working. I think this is an area where in our industry, in oil and gas, we are the kings of data. We are the kings of spreadsheets multiple decibel points uh, and requiring our employees to have superhero strength in going out and executing that in the field. And I think as Peter alluded to, we're talking about a workforce that is changing. Our demographics are changing, right? And yes, that means we're gonna have to put the slide rule away, right? We are going to have to change our work processes to talk about the technology that Consumers today demand, you know, in their personal lives, and we need to reimagine how we do that in our industrial workforce. So let me just, you know, quickly go through. I'm not going to cover this uh, slide because Peter already hit on it pretty well. The three points here is why are we having this discussion? We do see it's because we are looking at promoting innovation and, quite frankly, value creation in an ecosystem that does have best in class components and allows plug and play in terms of the work that we're doing, right? And you know, as Peter mentioned very clear, uh, clearly of, from an OPA standpoint, this is what the message was. Well, and frankly, for the digital twins, we are looking for the same activity. Now, you'll notice that on the word, uh, the word that's up there is digital twin architecture, or I would like to say ecosystem. What word is not on there is a software solution, right? You're gonna hear me say over and over again, remember digital twin in my version is an abstract concept. It's an ecosystem. It's an area where quite frankly, depending on your use case and value, the fidelity and the frequency of the model may have to change, right? In order to do that, we as an industry have got to have our minds open to the possibility that it is an ecosystem that you know harmoniously uh, plays together. So, I've used the term digital twin. Uh, this is a Venn diagram that we've had a, a couple of times. I won't spend a lot of time, but it's important to orient what it is I am talking about. You know, the Venn diagram here that you've seen, it's in the white paper. You know, if I look at the top left, we're talking about you know, models and simulations, right? Thermodynamics, RTOs, DMCs, first principles, right? In terms of driving end-to-end -end value chain. That is a digital twin, right? Um, or components of it can be used as part of a digital twin. If I look at the bottom here, right? Data, 1D, 2D, engineering data, inspection equipment, ERP systems for how we actually operate in the plant, it's all data, right? And in the top right, this is an area where we talk about visualization. There are many different com components of visualization, right? Um, there is you know, scanning, there is CAD, there is reality, there's self-capture, right? I mean, there's, self, there's multiple ways to capture visualization. 
And what we see is part of the future is where all of this comes together in the center to build this ecosystem of a digital twin, right? As we mentioned last June when we were having this discussion, I think I may have gotten off on the wrong foot in terms of the communication because I do really want to make sure it's clear that this is an area where it's not a single solution, it's an ecosystem that really drives broader uses and value cases. In so much as you know, Peter was talking before, you know, when, when people came out with the smartphone, do we really think they knew of all the apps and the value that you could get from it? When the first uh, cell phone came out, do you think they were thinking you can have LiDAR capture and do your own 3D imaging, right? In terms of the use cases, like, this again is that same concept of where is the environment in our industrial facilities that promotes that innovation and value creation that quite frankly, we haven't thought of yet. If we are going to change our industry in terms of, you know, make it more efficient, right? Remove, uh, you know, carbon out of the way we do our work. It's going to require us to think differently. Now, you know, we don't do digital for digital sake, nobody in here, otherwise you're gonna find yourself buying shiny keys and that will usually be, you know, short-lived. And yes, we have all done that, right? So uh, sometimes it's where we say we learn fast. But if I go back to the workshop that Peter mentioned before, we're doing this because we see value, right? During that workshop, uh, we, there was a, a published paper where we had over 50, you know, high value use cases that were identified in this workshop. And I will tell you internally with ExxonMobil, uh, we probably, you know, like uh, many other companies, that number is probably twice the size of that, right? And you'd say, it's like, okay, given that much value, what's stopping you? Well, part of this, I'm gonna walk you through, you know, in some cases, building stuff is easier than actually maintaining stuff, right? And one of the things that I wanna share with you is that in some of the pinch points, it's not so much as creating the digital debt, it's really talking about how do you make sure that, that, um, that asset that you have is part of the way you work, right? So you sustainability of those value cases will continue. Now, I've you know, took the liberty of taking those use cases and just splitting it up, just so you can get a broad range of there's operations, there's maintenance, reliability, and yes, engineering, right? And I think the key part here is it just depends on the use case, but where do we see the most value coming from? So now I'm going to change a little bit here because when we start talking about digital twins, we get into a lot of a, a standpoint of, okay, you know, it's my, it's my reality, right? It matches what's out in the field, right? Uh, we could probably have an an hour discussion of what everybody's definition of as built means, it means, right? Um, in terms of uh, is this concept of a digital represent, uh, representation a perfect reflection of reality? You know, at, at the design phase, you could probably sit there and say, well, yeah, because they built it based on the, you know, the activities. But did they, right? My point that I'm highlighting here is that this concept significantly underestimates the effort involved to make sure that your digital representation is in fact an actual reflection of reality. I mean, in the old days, how many people have been accused of buying rubber rulers? I'm the only one that has had rubber ruler syndrome, right? Where we have bought pipe and you went out there and you measured it and you're like, oh my gosh, how did we measure it wrong, right? Have you seen uh, you know, a model that, quite frankly, as you go to execute and install, that it's not exactly the, the, the right fit? You have construction issues, you have fabrication issues. My point here is just because you build a reference, um, it isn't necessarily a perfect uh, reflection of reality. So now, I'm gonna take you, a, a, you know, an alternative way as we talk about a foundation and an ecosystem, right? So let me start with where we are, right? Um, you know, some of the challenges that we have associated with digital twins, um, I'll go through this pretty quickly because this is not new news for this audience, right? Silo data that's not interoperable. You know, our ability to lift, as Peter just, you know, talked about his cell phone, 
there is a lot of platforms that we have within our industry that it is much harder to go from one to the other, right? Um, I would say when we get into what I would say is visualization, because that is the focus that I want to communicate. We're talking about 3D visualization of, uh, of our assets, right? That open asset digital twin. There are multiple types of data. There's different fidelities of data, right? And I think, you know, you sit there and say the use case of, you know, taking a picture, I can, you know, a picture worth a thousand words, I can do a lot with it. But if I'm talking about setting a compressor that I need a thousandth of an inch in terms of level, that's a different level of fidelity, right? And I think the key is, you know, instead of having multiple models, can I have an ecosystem where those two live together, right? Can I really get mileage out of work? I will tell you humbly within our company, this is an area where frankly, and I told this story in June, I'll tell it again, right? Uh, of some of the, uh, the wake ups that uh, we've had within ExxonMobil is I've had a scanning crew go out there because we're gonna go scan a unit to get this uh, reality capture, come back to me and said, Michael, let me tell you how smart you are. Like we had to wait until the previous company finished scanning the unit before we could scan it. Right? Because I have people out there going for single use, scanning it for their specific purpose. That's probably not the wisest use of my money, but the point here is that this is the area where we see an opportunity for things to come together for multiple use out of those digital assets. So um, yes, there is an opportunity for standards associated with this, um, but more importantly, in a lot of these cases as we build stuff, you know, getting to, well, how do we sustain them? What is the sustainment mechanism? Um, and I know there's a broad room here that is probably saying, well, Michael, we just use our MOC process. And I'm sitting there biting my lip going, okay, let me know how that works out for you. Um, because I think this is an area where I would challenge the room, is that the most efficient uh, process moving forward? Data governance and ownership. We've had this discussion, particularly as you start taking multiple uh, places in an ecosystem, right? I will tell you that in a lot of cases, a lot of my uh, uh, compadres as part of the ARC workshop, we all are very clear about that is our data. We wanna have control of it in our system. This is not an area where we're expecting to have multiple people in different clouds, et cetera. If I'm gonna build an ecosystem that is scalable, it is gonna be something that I'm going to have control in terms of that platform. And then lastly, you know, I have to be humble enough to sit there and say, you know, this technology or this technical debt that as an industry you hear a lot of buzz about, I often have to do some self-reflection in saying, you know, we are not very mature in terms of integrating it as part of our work process. Although I can argue that, you know, in the, you know, design bill, the EPC, in the Wayback Machine, we used to build these with the little plastic models, the Legos, right? When you build the representation of units. Yes, guess what? We don't do that anymore. It is all done electronically. It's all digital. So in the design build, the green fields construction, I have to admit there's probably a further up the maturity curve when it's talking about using the assets. But as we all know, those assets, once it's built and handed over to operations, is where we have a significant gap, or at least that's what I would profess. So let me take you on a little journey as an alternative approach, right? So fundamentally, you know, CAD models, just a you know, representation here, it may be a source of data for a digital twin, especially if you're working with an EPC, right? And you would sit there and you build something, they give, uh, give you a model. But one of the things I, from my perspective, I'd like to be clear about is most of the data that is given you in this asset is not originated in that cod model. Quite frankly, the only thing that is actually created in that CAD model is the geospatial or the layout and geometry of the pipes and vessels. Everything else, and for those that have also been a designer uh, in terms of uh, building equipment, everything else is built outside of that. And quite frankly, you know what you are seeing here is what was replacing the plastic models that we used to build before when it comes to a new unit. All of that data that is you know, pulled together, that is foundational 
uh, uh, part of this model, was created outside of it, and quite frankly, it was placed in it as a portal of information, right? Um, and I don't get me wrong, there's a lot of uses for that, but th that's the, the message I would deliver. Now, let me just quickly go say, I've got this model and I'm gonna go integrate it in the way we work, right? Okay, so I'm showing you a lens that if I were to go into any site and look at your, your CAD model and then go look at it with the glasses associated with, I'm looking at it from what assets are in your ERP, right? How you do your operations and your maintenance down to the asset level, you're likely to see this picture. You're likely to see that the only thing that you have operationalized is vessels, pumps, you know, uh, a tower, an instrument. There's a lot of, that's missing, isn't there? There's a lot of contextual information of part of your asset that quite frankly, I would challenge that you probably have no idea how you're gonna categorize that in terms of driving or improving uh, your overall uh, maintenance or operation of your facility. Just highlighting that we have room to go in terms of growing our maturity in these uh, systems. Now, I will say, from an alternative approach, if I do a reality capture, right, I can get a much higher fidelity of contextualization. And quite frankly, it allows the ability and allows me as an asset owner to integrate everything I see in this picture into a sustainable matter that is reality. Now, how many people here have been out uh, as part of an engineering project or an inspection? You walk out with an inspection ISO, walk out to the facility, talk to the operator saying, I'm looking for this spot in this inspection ISO. And most of the operators, <laughs> they've got some hands up in the back, right? And most of the operators are looking at it going, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't operate that way. You know, tell me where the pipe is or you know, what system and circuit it's on. The contextualization matters, right? And I think when I look at this picture, I see a much reliable uh, way to capture assets at a fidelity that if I'm going to get my maintenance person saying, hey, you know, to the right or this image from a geolocation where the yellow ladder is, is missing a bolt, I have a much better shot of doing that with a reality capture than I do as a part of, you know, an engineered model. Or quite frankly, now, you can, you can in a CAD model, you can build this same fidelity into it, right? You can, you can get to where you have put every drop, every steam tracing, you know, every insulation into your CAD model. You could do that. But I think there is an alternative way based on the changes in technology. So, now, in and by itself, I have to admit, you do a reality capture, you have a dumb picture, right? I mean, okay, it's a cool picture. It's 3D. It's no longer 2D but it's still a dumb picture. Where the value com comes is when you take that reality capture and then you enrich it with data. Remember what I said before around most of the data in a uh, CAD model is, um, originates outside of the actual uh, 3D representation? Well then, why wouldn't I take that same thing and then integrate it with a reality capture? What you're seeing here is a depiction uh, on a consumption channel where I have basically taken a reality capture. I've taken the same data that was provided and I've interlaced it in terms of now I have a skin that gives me, quite frankly, the fidelity of the uh, components that I want and it gives me the ability to connect it to a number of data sources. Now, if I bring your, your mind back to the pie chart, you remember I showed you around maintenance uh, engineering um, and uh, reliability. Um, if I take that same pie chart and let me reconfigure it. And this is our view, is that when I talk about the 50 plus value use cases, quite frankly, greater than 75% of those, I don't need a CAD model. All I need is contextualization and contextualization of the assets, dimensional, right? Uh, if I have that and interlace it with, uh, uh, with data, quite frankly, I can solve 75% you know, uh, of those with a single ecosystem as long as the uh, data is uh, uh, interlaced with it, right? Now, in order to do this, let me come back to a key principle. The only way that we will continue as much as Peter talked about his, his cell phone 
And as much as OPA is focused on the separation of hardware and software, right? That is one of the key premises of OPA. As we think about you know, the sustainability of an ecosystem, we really need to be back and continuing to signal to the market, we need to be able to separate data from software, right? We need to make sure that we can separate the two. Because I will tell you from a data ownership, it will be crystal clear within ExxonMobil where that data and that ownership is going to reside. But from a capability of having more value creation, again, back to where we can get more uh, um, use cases and things that are out of it, it's interaction with the data. It's not interaction with the software. And that will be a key component kind of moving forward. So just high level, you know, a, a number of these slides, <clears throat> or this slide's been used a number of times of, you know, what I would say is establishing some pillars to separate capturing of imagery, storing it, enriching it with data, and then quite frankly, presenting it to someone at any time, any place, on any type of device. And then the point across this is it's all about acceleration, adoption, and value capture, right? There is, a no, there is plenty of opportunities, things we haven't dreamt of. We talked about uh, in one of the discussions around procedures and interacting it. We've got, there's training, right? Immersive uh, training, right? But just think of the emergency procedure you ask your operator that you hope that you never have to go execute, right? You train on, why aren't we giving them you know, that mixed reality uh, type environment where quite frankly, you're aiding them in that, in that activity. I would tell you that, you know, if I were to go out there and say, I'm gonna go execute this on your CAD model, most of my operators would be right back where I was when I walked out there with the inspection ISO. They're like, you know, this doesn't match where we are today. Or quite frankly, go back to that concept. What does as built mean to you, right? Because in a lot of cases, our facilities are always dynamically changing. The question is, how are you gonna keep that model or that, what I say, ecosystem up to date? Think I'm crazy? Yes, no? Part of what I wanna share with you as an industry, we have got to get out of our own way. And I say that because other industries have actually already done what I've just highlighted. There are members here from the National Center of Simulation that, would, would, uh, that I encourage you to talk to about all the great work that's been going on in the defense industry, where they have you know, an open standards-based simulation for multiple suppliers to come together. I've met with a couple of companies that would share with me a stack of 15 uh, suppliers that they work together to develop a product that meets the needs of the Defense Department. Right? In our industry, what can I point to? We've heard uh, today a lot from the gaming, right? And yes, you know, uh, Unity is here. I'm glad they do a lot of great work uh, in our industry. NVIDIA and uh, uh, Epic are also doing quite a bit in that space. In that, you know, industry, being open, plug and play and interoperable is the key to survival. Right? If you don't believe me, talk to them. They'll tell you what some of the challenges that they've had. And just on the bottom here, right? Again, manufacturing or uh, smart cities and real estate. I mean, even to the far right where people are using self-capture as an imagery to interlace it with data, right? These are all examples to where when you talk about the concept of an open asset digital twin, other industries are well ahead of oil and gas. And part of what I want to do is make sure that from, you know, compelling of this is not about, you know, being vendor, uh, you know, locked or, you know, pick winning and losers. This is about creating an ecosystem to where, quite frankly, innovation and value can grow. So a couple of things here. The, the top message is what I really want to talk away in order to get to what I would say is a number of us as part of the ARC working committee have highlighted of, you know, getting to this open asset digital twin or moving to a more visual way of working. We do need industry and suppliers to come together. We do need to, to work together on some of the pinch points that we've established, right? Below that, as I've, I've said, you know, this cost plus model, you know, in terms of how do you support activities, 
I would say that if you have people that are suggesting they have the digital twin for you, I would say buyer beware, right? Because I would sit there and, and wonder is what is the long-term B2C and the sustainability that you actually are gonna have and what work process are you gonna utilize to make sure that that value is returned year on year? Lastly, you know, it's on here about reality capture as an alternative ways to provide a platform to interlace because I do see the value of where CAD and reality capture, quite frankly, is one. Just as simply as you on your phone can sit there and say, look at street view versus satellite view. Tell me why I can't do the same, right, in a reality capture associated with my asset. But in all of those concepts, in order to get there, we need to stay focused on separating data from software. Thank you.